here she goes. Speak of the devil. Hello, Dr. Lohman. Oh my gosh, I just called you and left a message. Hello there. It's Megan Vick and you can dance. Hi. If I can get, oh my gosh. Wait, we got to get our video going here. Yes. Hello, Meg Lohman. Oh, there we go. How's that? Are we here? Oh, he's about to start. <gasps> okay. Go to gallery view you go to gallery view. Okay, I'm going to, um, I've spotlighted your video. The students are all joining right now. Okay. Bill Giant, oh, look it up. It's her um, Guys, let me mute all. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to make you co-host. Are you comfortable with that? Hold on, I muted you, so I have to unmute you. One second. Ask to unmute. Are you okay with me making you a co-host? Okay. All right, I have just made you a co-host. Great, so then we can show the pictures at our end. We can do the share screen option. Yes, ma'am. And if you will just give us a few minutes for all of our viewers to join us. Sounds great. We sure will. This is so exciting. <laughs> We're so glad. Can you see that now? Um, hold on just a minute. I'm trying to answer messages from a couple of students who haven't been able to get on just yet. Sure. <clears throat> Yes, we can see it. Thank you. I am also going to make co-host some of the other teachers because I have muted a lot of our students just so it, a lot of background information isn't happening. So we are going to have multiple co-hosts. He's asleep. <laughs> Lost Cressa. There she is. Right, I think I've made most every one of our teachers co hosts. Um, co hosts, do you guys see anyone who might be missing? Let me, okay, so I, you can't unmute yourselves, can you? Yes, we can unmute. Okay, okay, good. Do you see anyone missing? I 
I don't see Rourke. Miss Rourke. All right, um, those of you who are on here, if you'll turn on your video so everyone can see your faces. And um, where could Miss Rourke be? Remember, we talked about how that's very respectful to have your video on. Um, so Dr. Lohman, let me just give you a little um, background information. So we are at a school in Laverne, Tennessee, which is just outside of Nashville. We are a very diverse and wonderfully mixed group of fifth graders, nine and, I mean, sorry, 10 and 11 year olds. About a fourth of our students have been learning this whole year through remote learning. And the other three fourths of our students are in person. So you have some teachers who are logged in through their account and then their students can see through their account. And then you have several students who are logged in. Those are all of our distant learners. Wow. Well, we're pretty impressed at that. <laughs> so should we start up? Is this a good time or are we waiting for some more? Um, I'm getting a message from Miss Terry that her, um, there's no camera on her desktop. Um, I may need to go and check. Press is having trouble with audio. Um, I think I'm good now. Okay. Is everyone else good except Terry? And but um, I will go check on Miss Rourke and Miss Terry. If you want to go ahead and begin, because I don't want to keep you um, and and delay your time. I know that you have so it's fine. much. Well, we'll give you, as long as it's not an hour away where you're going, we're okay. Yes. Okay, yes, she's just got on here. Can you check on Miss Terry? Okay, um, I think Miss Terry, everybody's here except Miss Terry needed some help. Miss Terry, did you get it figured out or no? She may not even be able to hear me. Let me go and check on her real quick. Sure, take your time. It's almost their lunch time. Okay, Dr. Lohman, I think we are all set up and ready to go. So whenever you are ready, we are ready. Okay, fantastic. So uh, Vic and I are in Florida, just so the students know. And we are going to give you about 10 minutes by me talking about exploring the rainforest and another five minutes by Vic talking about how we can pay for conservation. So hopefully that way you get a little smattering of biology and a little bit of math. Um, and then we would go to questions and we were hoping that we could leave that up to you, Rachel, to call on the teachers or the students or whatever is convenient for at your end. So we're excited to share with you a little few extra facts that we call them secrets about the rainforest that may not have been in the book that you've already studied. So just want to make sure, Rachel, you can see the screen okay? Great. Yes, so I'd love the kids to raise their hands if they ever, ever climbed a tree in their whole life. 
maybe you can see the hands raised. We have to raise our hands too because we've climbed trees. Anyway, it is a funny thing that most people love to climb a tree. Maybe it's because our ancestors came from the trees. Uh, but for me as a scientist, that's kind of a nice thing that kids are interested in what lives at the top of a tree, which is my research. And technically I am called an arbornaut. There's a big word for everybody. An astronaut goes into outer space. An arbornaut goes to the tops of the trees. And here's some of my kids in Raleigh, North Carolina, climbing up their trees that probably are pretty similar to your trees, oaks and maples and walnuts and um, a few locusts and things that probably grow in Tennessee as well. So everyone is perhaps an arbornaut, at least in your childhood, and maybe you'll grow up and become one. And that kind of leads me to secret number one, that ability and uh, method to climb trees that you saw in the book where we go up ropes sometimes is only about 40 years old. So the whole world of canopy science is really very young. Physics and chemistry are thousands of years old and exploring outer space really was launched in the 1960s when we went to the moon and studying coral reefs started in the 1950s when scuba gear was developed, but we never really had any methods to climb trees until the 1980s. So it's a new science. It's also an urgent science because so many forests are getting cut down now. And you can see me in this picture where I had made myself a harness and I actually um, welded a slingshot out of a piece of metal my first time that I climbed a tree so that I could fire a fish line over a branch to get the rope up to the top of the tree. So that was pretty much fun, to be honest. Um, and here's a couple of my students using ropes still today. And this is Anthony. He studies redwoods. He's over 300 feet high in that tree. He is a much better climber than I am. And he discovered that redwoods actually take in moisture from fog directly into their foliage, not only from the root system all the way up those humongous trees. So that was a pretty cool discovery. Here's another team of students in Taiwan where we climbed trees that were also over 300 feet high. I actually put arrows to the people because the people look so little and the tree is so, so big. And here is secret number two from that rope harness and slingshot gadgetry, we now know that over half of the species on the land part of our planet live at the top of a tree. So that's a pretty big discovery for the last 40 years. And that also means it's a pretty important part of the planet to try to save and not burn it down or clear it. I think you can all see which one is the koala. And hopefully you know which one is a beetle. And in the top right is a dogwood, which I think grows in Tennessee. Um, the bottom right is my cutest little red-eyed tree frog from Belize. And that funny bird with the red balloon is a frigate bird in Galapagos Islands. And they use that red balloon to find a girlfriend. <laughs> so that's kind of what birds do. They have to be colorful when they're looking for a mate. And of course, ants, that cute little ant has a rear end that looks like a leaf for camouflage. So there are all sorts of cool creatures living at the tops of trees and so many left to study. Out of that 50% of life on earth, we think probably about 90% has never been seen before. So that leaves a lot of species that maybe some of you might discover if you want to grow up and become an arbor nut someday. Um, most of them are insects. The world is full of millions of bugs. So promise me you won't squish insects ever again. Lots of them are so useful as pollinators, as uh, decomposers of all of our trash. And of course, some are really beautiful like butterflies and lots of them eat leaves like caterpillars pictured here and that cool little walking stick that's eating a flower. Um, so there's lots of things to find in the top of the tree with six legs, which are insects. Um, there are also many 
flowers and plants that live in the tops of trees. The orchids, which are the biggest family of flowering plants on the earth, have many, many of their species that live as air plants in the tops of trees. Also mosses and lichens and vines all make their lives up in the treetops. Um, here's a microscopic creature in the trees. Anyone know what this is? I know you're all muted, so I won't hear your answers, but maybe you can tell your teacher later if you knew what it was. Um, this is an extremophile organism. If you know what that is, it's able to live in very hot and very cold places, and it's called a water bear. So perhaps for extra credit, the students could look up water bears, but they love to live in, live in drops of water. Probably 20 could fit on your little fingernail. They're that tiny, and I'm guessing they're probably the commonest thing in your schoolyard. They're everywhere that there's moisture, on leaf surfaces, on in bark crevices, in soil, in, even in uh, hot springs and even in Antarctica, which is kind of amazing. Um, some things use the canopy, even if they don't live there. Here's a leopard in India that used the canopy to eat its breakfast after it killed an animal. So that makes it still important for a lot of additional species. And here's another method that we've developed to get to the treetops. Uh, in about 1985, I and a few others started building these things called treetop walks, which gives us a lot of great easy access. There's a pretty cool one in Ohio, maybe that's a little bit close to you near Cleveland. And there are now about 50 of these around the world, which are really great for getting close up to the leaves or things that live in the tops of trees. Um, another method that we use, and you might have seen this in the book, is the inflatables. We have a hot air balloon to travel over the tops of trees, and we have this very cool raft that you see here getting towed by the balloon. It's just about to put that raft at the top of that tree in Cameroon, Africa, and then we'll tie the raft to the branches and use it kind of like a space station or a base camp for up to a week at a time to go up and down the tree and study things at the very top. And here I am, you can probably just barely see me, oops, um, coming up this rope at night into a little porthole here to walk around this raft. There's a trampoline type of mesh and there are these cute little donut holes where I can stick my hand through and grab bugs or leaves or things that I need to sample. But this raft is fabulous for working at nighttime, which is pretty hard to do with the ropes because you can't really see where you're going. So we do love to use the raft during those darker hours. Um, the fourth tool, in addition to ropes and walkways and um, also inflatables, is this construction crane. And there are about 10 of these around the world, which are really great for access to anything within the arm of the crane. It doesn't work so well to move it very far away, like the ropes can be taken in a duffel bag all around the world. But the crane is a great easy way to get in the canopy because you can ride in the bucket. So that makes it pretty nice for students or people that might otherwise be frightened of climbing or get a little bit, um, you know, of acrophobia, fear of heights. So here we are in a crane in Australia, which is kind of neat. Um, so <laughs> with all this, secret number three <coughs> says, well, guess what? Canopy work is fun for kids. And this picture shows a canopy walkway about 10 minutes away from where Vic and I are sitting now. And this is in Florida. It's in a state park outside of Sarasota. And these third graders actually discovered a new species on their field trip with their teacher. So it just shows you that if you keep your eyes open, all you students, and look for things if you get to the treetops, maybe you too can become a scientist when you're only 10 or 11. Um, it doesn't need a PhD and it doesn't need lots of years of training to have your eyes open when you're up in the treetops. And here's one of my future scientists practicing discovering things in her treetops of her backyard. 
um, even my own boys when they were little, as you know from the book, um, became arbor nuts and helped me find things in the canopy. And they went to Belize and they went to the Amazon and a few other places um, helping their mom at work. So all of you might be able to make some discoveries, even in small trees, even in bushes, even in grass, if you're afraid of heights. Um, in fact, here are some of my students in wheelchairs, and we figured out a way with pulleys um, to bring them into the treetops. And Rebecca here on the left actually found eight new species of water bears in oak trees in Kansas. So you don't often have to travel all the way to the Amazon to find something new. Um, Secret number four, trees keep us alive. That's something really important that didn't get discussed in the book you studied, but I think it's important for all of you to know how critical it is for us to save trees if you all expect to grow up and have a healthy planet. Um, and with that, I wanna give you a little example here in Ethiopia, um, but this slide illustrates a few things that are important for you to know. Trees provide clean water that filters through the canopy. They provide oxygen, as you know, and keep our air clean. They provide a lot of medicines around the world. Timber, of course, we all know that, uh, honey. They conserve soil because the roots of trees keep the soil from flooding down rivers and going out to the ocean. Um, if you didn't have trees, you would probably not have too much topsoil. Uh, trees store carbon, which is really important because humans pollute the air with carbon dioxide. And now trees are very busy taking in all that carbon and trying to keep our air healthy. And lots of foods, if you like chocolate or oranges or cherries, or if your teachers like coffee or your parents, then you have to love trees. Um, lots of other building materials, ropes and roofing material, etc., come from trees. And for almost 2 billion people, trees are very important for religious reasons, their spiritual values. And that's what this picture shows you here. This is Ethiopia, and you can see how hot and dry most of that area is because it's agricultural. It's been cleared to grow crops. And the only trees left are these little green dots of forest. And so that means there's less than 5% of the forests left in Northern Ethiopia. And that's pretty urgent. We need to help them save those trees really desperately. And you can go on my website um, and look at pictures and hear about how we're saving these forests in Ethiopia. You can also see in this picture, the center of that forest has a church. So that's the secret to saving the trees. The priests believe that they have to save all of God's creatures. And as a scientist, I believe I have to help save biodiversity. So I'm working with the religious leaders in Ethiopia to build walls around these forests so that the cattle can't get in and eat the trees and the seedlings and the farmers can't plow by mistake and the kids don't accidentally take trees around the edges for firewood because sometimes they look a little drier and maybe not so healthy as the ones on the inside. So we're working really hard to try to build these walls and raise a bit of money to help buy the gates and move the stones so that all the kids in Ethiopia don't lose their pollinators and don't lose their water, their clean water, and have all the medicines that they need that come from these trees. So here is a picture of the priests blessing one of these walls. And this slide says that we need now to partner science in business, not just research, but we have to really figure out creative ways to be able to afford to save these forests in places like Ethiopia that are otherwise very poor. So I'm gonna turn it over to Vic to talk a little bit about the business side of how we save forests. Hi, Vic. Hi, Meg. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Miss Gaither. Thank you very much indeed for the wonderful work you and your colleagues do in teaching these children in these very difficult times. I take my hat off to you and thank you very much indeed for what you're doing. Um, I wanted to ask the children, I'm sure they know this already, but how many people live on the earth? Do they know? Anybody want to have a guess? Nobody? Maybe they're. Maybe a billion? 
Yeah, about seven billion. That's about two hundred million. More than seven billion, more than seven billion, billion in the whole world. Yeah. world. But people hey, that's, four billion, that's right? about two billion or something. Four billion. Or, or... So okay. it's it's seven point eight billion, and do you know how much a billion is? I mean that's important. I mean you don't you understand that a billion is <laughs> a thousand million. That's how many people there are on the earth today. A thousand seven point eight billion, which is and a billion is a thousand million. And in thirty years, which is when you're all going to be parents, there are going to be fifteen billion people on the earth. So in 30 years, that number of people is going to double. So you could see there is a big fight going on between people needing land and Meg, who's trying to save the land because she understands that without the trees, we are not going to have anything. We're not going to have a planet that's cool enough, that's got enough rain, that's got enough oxygen. So we need to find a way that is sensible to invest money in places where most of the time the very poorest of the poor live. You have particularly, for example, in the Amazon where you have big business people coming in and the first thing they do is they offer tribes people money to cut down their trees and the money is paid and then the trees are gone. And so people then said, well, fine, what we can do is we can recreate the earth. We can do it by artificial means. And about 35 years ago, they built this construction here that looks like a pyramid. It was a biosphere and they spent $200 million and they had eight people living in there for two years. And Meg was not living in there, but she was one of the advisors to this project. And in that biosphere, they introduced living conditions as you would find them on the earth. They had savannas, they had oceans, they had coral reefs, they had fish, they had trees, they had grass, they had animals. And guess what happened after two years? Almost all the animals were dead except for your favorite animal, which is a cockroach. That was the only one that was left. And the air inside that biosphere was so bad, it was basically like living on the top of a mountain in the Himalayas. So for $200 million, they were not able to do that for eight people. And just so that you understand what that means, there are eight people being born every three seconds on the earth today. So that shows you how difficult it would be to recreate a planet like we have now with artificial means. But there's a much smarter way to go about doing this. And if we could go to the next uh, slide here, you could see these beautiful trees are in the Catskill Mountains just outside of New York City. And there was a developer coming in and he wanted to buy that entire region and put up shopping malls and housing and so on and so forth. And they would have needed to build a water treatment plant for the city of New York for $6 billion. And somebody said, hold on a second. Why don't we just buy all of that land and let New York get its water from the forests just as they have been for the last couple of hundred years. And they spent $1.5 billion buying up all the land. So they were never developed. And so the forests have been maintained and New York gets its water from those wonderful forests. And they have the best water of any big city in the whole of the United States coming down from these natural forests outside of the city. So as you can see, uh, you have to be smart uh, in the way you spend your money and you have to uh, figure out a way to, to do this. Um, and uh, I think Meg is, you know, sounding the call for us all to be aware of it. And so remind your parents, your teachers know about this already. Remind your friends, uh, remind anybody that basically wants to listen to you that your future depends on the fact that these trees are going to have to be around. Otherwise, we're going to be too hot and too sweaty and too smelly <laughs> too thirsty. and too thirsty <laughs> and we're going to have trouble breathing. So anyway, 
back over to you. Fantastic. Any, any questions? So now we can move on to some questions, Rachel, and put it back to you if you unmute yourself and we'll just turn our screen share off, but we'll still be here to talk. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is just like I feel like I'm in a dream right now. This is such an amazing experience for all of us and our students. Oh, we're glad. Um, so I would like to reach out to Ms. Baskerville first. Ms. Baskerville, if you would like to unmute yourself and allow one of your students to ask a question. Sure, hello. We're so excited to be doing this. Hello. Thomas, come over here. And everybody like to say hello to me. Hi there, everybody. Hi there. I didn't even know where the camera was. This is Thomas, and he would like to ask you a question. Uh, yeah, I wanted to know what was your greatest discovery. Okay, so I guess as one of the first arbornauts, the best discovery ever was figuring out that half of the species on the planet live up there. It was so surprising to go to the top of a tree and find it be really busy. Lots of things are buzzing and flying and pollinating. And quite honestly, sometimes the bottom of a forest is quiet and dark. And so you would never have any idea that all those cool things are living at the top. Great question, thanks. Evie. All right, Ms. Baskerville, did you have another question one of your students wanted to yes, ask? Yes, she's right here, they're ready. I'll, I'm the one who like uh, didn't find the camera. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> this is Evie. Anyways, uh, I just wanted to know, since like your kids like discovered the slingshot spider, what's the official or scientific name of it? Just wanted to oh, know. Oh, right, now that is a very cool question. You'll be amazed when you hear this answer. That slingshot spider is a new species, but it is still sitting on the desk of the world's slink spider expert at the Smithsonian Museum. So he has so many hundreds of vials of new spiders that it hasn't yet got its name. Maybe one of you has to grow up and become what we call an arachnologist, a spider expert, and give him a hand because they have so much what we call backlog. Um, Anyway, so thanks for asking that because my boys will probably be all grown up by the time they get the name of that spider. <laughs> I want, we have one more. This is Jesse. My question is, what made you want to study the canopy? Oh my gosh. Um, I think growing up in upstate New York in a small town where I played outside a lot and the leaves changed color and that always amazed me that they turned red and yellow and then they fell. And when I first went to the canopy of a rainforest, they stay green all year. I was just so surprised <laughs> and I thought, holy cow, this is the most different thing I've ever seen. And where Vic's from Africa, what happens to your leaves? Do they fall or stay? No, they, most of the time they stay on the trees, but they turn gray and get very, they don't fall off, but they get very gray and brown and, and then just, and then spring comes along and then all of a sudden they turn green again, yeah. Because that's a drier rainforest in Africa yeah. than it is in the Amazon. So thanks for asking. Where Thank exactly you so much. Where is Vic from? I'm from Zimbabwe, so I am uh, right in the middle of the bush in the middle of Africa. That's where I come from. Thank you. It's been a long time since I lived there, as you could imagine. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Baskerville and your students. Okay, Ms. Buck, would you like to have one of your students unmute and ask their question? Yes. Um, let's have Mia go ahead and unmute. Sorry, I'm doing your class my favorite. We might have to unmute her for, I don't know that the students can unmute. Okay. Um, okay for Nia. I got her unmuted. Go ahead, oh, Nia. Oops, I just muted her. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Nia. If you had not become a scientist, what have you, what, what have you been and why? 
Oh, wow. Okay. If I hadn't been a scientist, maybe I would have been an architect because trees have such beautiful architecture. I always think about that when I look at buildings or shapes and try to think about how you cool buildings or how you let light in. That really fascinates me. And also secretly, I might have been a chef. I love to cook too. <laughs> so if you hadn't been a banker, Vic, what would you have been? I think I would have liked to have been a pediatrician. I like dealing with kids. Oh, and, and, yeah, a children's so that's, doctor. That's what I would have, but I'm, cool. not, I'm not clever enough. For that, so. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Okay. All right, Tamara, you're next. Okay. So my question was, what was one of your favorite places to visit? Okay. Well, we'll both answer that. Then probably my favorite, I did love Australia because of course those were the first rainforest trees that I climbed and explored. But if I had to wave a magic wand and take you to a most beautiful rainforest, I would probably take you to the Amazon. And I would take you to Peru because not as much has been burned and cleared as it has in Brazil. And then you could see the sloths and the scarlet macaws and all the cool things that I know you would probably love to see. What's your favorite place? Uh, my favorite place is the uh, sort of northeastern part of South Africa, just running alongside the Mozambique border, because that's where the game parks are. And you can go there and watch elephants and lions and uh, giraffes and hippos and all those wonderful animals as they live properly in the bush, uh, it is quite truly magnificent and you don't see another human being or a telegraph pole or a light or anything because you can also then look at the stars from there because the stars are very, very bright in the Southern hemisphere. And if you have no darkness, uh, no, no light pollution around you, you can really see the Milky Way and all those wonderful places. So I like Southern Africa uh, in the middle of the bush. Thanks, Tamara. Great. Miss Buck, did you have any more students? I have one more. Onesimus, you're up. How long does it take to get to the top of the camp? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, it's a course like any sport. Some people are faster and some people are slower. And in my case, because I was studying what was up there and I didn't want to scare them away, sometimes I would have to climb a bit slowly so that I didn't shake the branches too much. But if we were trying to get to the top quickly, just perhaps to get one thing like a leaf and pick it, um, then we could, maybe it would take five minutes to climb about a hundred feet just to give you a sense of that. Um, and there are a few of the photographers from National Geographic that could climb a uh, hundred feet in about 30 seconds too. So some people are really fast, but then when they do that, they do scare away a lot of the birds and insects as you can imagine. Great question. Thank you. All right, Miss Terry, would you like to have one of your students ask a question? Hi, Dr. Loman. Um, and I'm sorry, Vic, I, I, I didn't get your last name. I'm sorry. But I have three students here that's going to ask some questions. And Great. so it's a pleasure meeting you guys. And thank you for everything you do. And so first thank we you. have Sophia. OK. Um, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you, what was, what was it like climbing the canopy? Well, the first time I did it, I was really scared. I thought I might turn upside down on the rope and I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't very balanced, but when I got better coordinated at it, it is very exciting. It's beautiful. It's fantastic because it's so full of different things to see and hear and smell. Even all the flowers are fabulous up there. So then it became really and truly very fun. And I enjoyed it a lot, except when it was raining. But we usually don't climb in the rain because it could endanger the ropes and make them get moldy. And you don't want a rope to break. That's for sure. Thanks. Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. All right, we have Giselle next. Wow. 
My question was, what type of animals animals were hard were hard to work with? Okay, um, I'll answer it for the Amazon and I'll let Vic talk a little about Africa. Anno actually, mammals are very hard to work with because they're shy. Finding enough sloths to measure how many leaves they eat or in Australia, finding enough koalas to measure how many leaves they eat is pretty tricky. Believe it or not, studying insects was sometimes easier because you never just see one beetle, you see about a hundred in your garden eating the leaves. So sometimes it was easier to study things that were common than things that were rare, if that makes sense to you. Um, the other thing is things that feed at night were harder to study because obviously it was dark and hard to see them. And a lot of insects do feed at night. This is not surprising because they're escaping the birds from eating them by day. So I did have to go out at night a lot of times to find the beetles eating the leaves. What about what's hard to work on in Africa? Well, I mean, the animals in Africa, of course, as you all know, are big, <laughs> very, very big. And so it's, it's uh, uh, really most of the, of the work there is, is focused on, on, on protecting them. Uh, you, you have certain groups of animals like the rhinos where people are out there trying to kill them because they want the rhino horn. Um, they want to kill lions because they make uh, people believe that they are very brave when they kill them and take home the skull of the elephant of the, of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the lion. Uh, the, the, probably the, the very difficult ones to find are leopards. Uh, there are very few of them left. Uh, so, and they almost always go out at night uh, and hunt. So leopards are probably the hardest thing to find. I'm, I'm not talking about, um, you know, birds and, and things like that. There are some birds that are very rare nowadays, but, but basically in terms of the big animals, leopards are quite, quite difficult to find. Thank you both for answering my question. You're welcome. And lastly, we have Dorado. Um, hello. Hello, Dorado. <laughs> um, my question is, what was your favorite and, and least favorite thing about the rainforest? Oh, okay, I guess my favorite thing is um, just having all those fabulous trees. I'm sure I'm, you know, getting the best oxygen in the world and seeing all these new species and watching everything. It, work. It's fantastic. I just loved being there and I liked sharing it with my kids, which was especially fun. And I guess the least favorite thing might be coming home. Sometimes you have to come back and hear all the noises of the city and all the lights, like Vic was saying, and you have to eat food that's full of chemicals sometimes. So sometimes it was really quite a shock to come back and hear all the noises of our neighborhood. Um, what do you think? Uh. <laughs> yeah, my, you know, it's just, it's just, as you say, it's just so different than, than where you live any, any, at any given time. It's just wonderful to be back in, in nature the way it was uh, a thousand years ago, or 5,000 years ago, and it hasn't been touched essentially. And, and it's just a, a wonderful sensation to be that close to the animals and the trees and the grass and the sounds and all of those things. That's really what's so special about it, I have to say. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's nice to meet you. You Thank too. You. Same here. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Crabtree, would you like to have some of your students ask their questions? Yes, thank you. The first question we have is gonna come from Avery. Avery, have you ever met someone native to the rainforest? And if you oh, have, you like great question, yes. I always meet people who live in the rainforest and grew up there. And of course the medicine man called the shaman in the Amazon is one of those people who's inherited all of his knowledge from his 
family through many generations. And we often have people there who help cook and help guide us and help keep us uh, take our boats out with us because they know all of the map and the location of where we need to go to find certain kinds yeah. of trees. So the local people are really, really important. And in Ethiopia, if you look at some of the pictures on my website, you'll see the priests that have grown up there. And of course, they have no computers or cell phones, but all their knowledge comes from their fathers and grandfathers. So there's a lot of local knowledge. And I think the same in Africa. Yeah, and, and you still have a system in Africa, even though it's very modern modern in many, many places that uh, the chief, the village chief is still the boss there. I mean, they have their own police enforcement, if you want to call it that. And you also have to ask his permission to, to, to go to these places. I mean, they give you their blessing and, and you go there with their permission. And that's important to have these people work with you and, and understand what you're doing and understand that you're not taking anything away from them, but you're going to help bring them something which is important for them. So yes, local people are very important. Thank you. We have one more question from Gabriel. Uh, hello. Um, I would like to ask this question. How did you get the opportunity to make the book the most beautiful roof in the world? Well, in this case, the actual lady that wrote the text approached me because she wanted to come to the rainforest and create a book about the canopy. So it was really her idea. I have written a few books. You could go on my website and find those. Maybe for extra credit, you can read one. I have a book coming out in August called The Arbor Knot. Maybe that could be extra credit and the teachers might find that book interesting because it's a lot about being a girl in science. Um, and so I think sometimes when you do work um, and you want to share the stories or you might want to, in my case, save the trees, the best thing to do about it is talk about it. And so writing a book and having people read a book is a good way of sharing the message. So that's kind of how those things evolve but it is i never thought about that when i was your age so sometimes you could surprise yourself <laughs> thank you all right thanks thank you all right miss glenn would you like to have some of your students share their questions Thank you very much for answering our questions today. Sure. This is uh, my this is my friend Peyton. He would like to ask you a question. Hi, Meg. Um, were you able to use medicine? If so, oh, were you um, able to use medicine in the rainforest? If so, what type of medicine did you use? Absolutely. And that interests me a lot because you know what? When bugs eat leaves, which they do a lot, the leaves make chemicals to defend themselves from getting eaten. And it's those chemicals that are the medicines that get harvested. So I was always interested in medicines because it may, it indicated that the leaves were being defended from the insects. So a lot of times I would work with the medicine man or the shaman so we could share our knowledge. <coughs> there is a medicine for just about everything in the Amazon, in the same in Africa and the same in Asia. Everything from a cut to being pregnant to having a very sore throat to even having a eye infection. I promise you there is a tree and a leaf for almost everything. And if you go to visit the shaman or the medicine man, they're the experts that help the people in the village or help me when I'm visiting them to figure out which leaves we need to use for which cure. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great question. I have one more question. This is Nevaeh. Hi. Hi, Dr. Lola. My name is Nevaeh. And my question for you today is, have you ever made a connection with the animal in the rainforest? If so, which one? Oh, have I made a connection with an animal in the rainforest? And I'll let Vic answer as well. Um, Yes, I have. And you know, funny things happen because I think sometimes when you're in the forest and there aren't very many people for thousands of miles, 
the animals aren't as scared of us as they might be if there were lots and lots of people. Once I was up in a tree eating my sandwich and all of these monkeys came very close. I think they wanted to eat my sandwich. They scared me a little bit, but they were really very funny and they started throwing leaves and branches at me. So I did give them my sandwich, but um, for the most part, animals are pretty shy. And we do try to be careful not to influence their behavior in any way. And how about you in Africa, Vic? Yeah, I think one of the things that's important uh, when you go to these places in Africa is not to disturb the animals at all. So even if you see a small baby buck that's lying sick on the ground, you don't help it. You don't pick it up. You don't do anything. You let the lions or you let the jackals or you let the hyenas come and eat it. So really, that's the most important thing when you go to these places in Africa is just never interfere at all with any of the nat nature things that you get to see there. Um, and and uh, yeah, that's a lesson that you learn very quickly there. And I think, uh, you know, it's very different than when you're up close like that in, in the trees. Uh, you have this massive area of bush and the animals are much, much bigger than you have up there. They're much more dangerous, of course, in Africa, but they also are frightened of you and they kind of run away most of the time. Very, very seldom does anybody get hurt by the animals and you just stay out of their way and they stay out of your way. That's the best way to do it. And you can look at them and photograph them and do all those wonderful things, but don't touch them. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's all we have for you. Thank you. Next, um, Isaiah, I am going to unmute you and you can ask Dr. Lohman and Mr. Vic your question. So Isaiah, go ahead and ask your question, buddy. Oh, I think he's on mute. He was. I unmuted him. I don't know what happened. Let me see. Let me get back to him. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Go ahead, Isaiah. We can hear you. Did you have some sort of defense mechanism if a wild animal try to come into your little research home or you did your research and That's why? A great question. And do you know, to be honest, I really didn't have too much defense at all. I never carried a gun. I had my slingshot, but I'm not sure that would work up close if a jaguar came into my tent or something. <laughs> so the bottom line is, I think like Vic said, I counted on the fact that the animals were more frightened of us than we were of them. But that is something important to think about. And, you know, it's been fortunate for me that I haven't had too many real problems. Um, poisonous snakes were an issue in Australia, but they're very shy. For the most part, they don't kind of look for us. In fact, if we get a snake bite, it's usually by an accident stepping on one and surprising them. It's not something that they aggressively try to do. Um, it's a little different in Africa, maybe, though. Uh, it's the same thing. I mean, I, uh, really, the, the only animal that you, you really uh, come in, in, in contact with, which can be nasty, is, is a hippo. Uh, hippos, um, you know, spend almost all their lives in the water because they get sunburned. And so they are underwater and at night they get up out of the water to feed. And they walk out of the water and they walk uh, probably sometimes five or six or seven miles and they leave, as you can imagine, it's almost like a big tractor walking through the, <laughs> through the reeds. They leave a path, and uh, that is the path that most of the uh, tribes, people, the Africans, when they go to get water from the river, they walk down those hippo paths. And if you bump into a hippo when he's coming up and you're going down, they can be very dangerous. And in fact, they are the cause of most deaths of any animal in Africa are caused by hippos. Mm. So uh, that, that's one thing you have to be careful about. Just don't bump into a hippo at night, especially one that's got a little baby. I mean, if they have babies, they really are quite, uh, they don't take a joke. Uh, they're very unpleasant. Thank you. 
All right, Madison Billings, I'm gonna unmute you. Um, my question is, do you always have to move when you go to different rainforests? Oh, great question. Um, a sometimes yes and sometimes no. So for example, when we work in the Amazon, we always go to the same place because we have a great big canopy walkway there. Uh, but when we sometimes work in Ethiopia, where I'm working now, we travel around to different church forests, those little forests where the, the forest is surrounding the church, um, and you work in different places and sometimes stay in different places. Sometimes two or three forests are within the same distance of our where we make our camp, but other times we have to travel between. So that's a really great question. And um, depending on the question in science that we ask, sometimes it's important to go back to the same place all the time and other uh, for other research, it's good to see new trees and get new creatures. And so that uh, ability to be at the same camp or change camp is always different for every project. Cool. Oh, Miss Gaither, you're now, you're muted. <laughs> Miss Rourke, um, could you now have one of your students ask their questions? Thank you so much. All right, my, no, I need my three students. Hang on, I'm sorry, they're coming. I have a question too. Christian, come on. All right, this, this, is, this is Christian. Hi, Christian. Hi, Christian. Um, why did you want to become a scientist? Oh, uh, you know, I didn't really know that girls could be scientists when I was little, so I didn't think of becoming a scientist until I got bigger. And I guess it's because I liked trees and I was excited about studying trees that I eventually became a scientist. So that, thanks for asking that. Okay. I saw some pretty cool kids in that classroom. Look at the leaves on the wall. They look really nice. <laughs> what is the most interesting thing you, oh wait. Yeah. We're, what is the most interesting thing? Okay, then ask, the, ask another question. Were you ever scared at your job? Was I ever scared? Yeah, of your job. A little bit. I have always was a little bit scared about if the tree branch would break. Sometimes I worried that maybe it looked big and strong, but it might have been rotten on the inside. So that was a little bit of a worry. And sometimes I worried a bit about maybe getting bitten by insects, especially if there were ant colonies up a tree. Some of the ants have a pretty bad bite or a sting. So that was always a worry. But um, not too serious. So far, so good. There weren't too many. I'm still alive to tell you about it. <laughs> Thanks. All right, we've got one more. This is Nicholas. Hi. Who or what inspired you to be a scientist? Well, maybe growing up in a small town where I played outdoors a lot because I got to learn about nature and probably that made me curious about things like trees and birds nesting in trees and insects eating trees. So I think a lot of it had to do with playing outdoors. I hope you guys all get a chance to play outdoors in your life because it does help you perhaps to learn a lot about science even without making it too much work. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. All right, Mr. Merriweather is the last teacher we have on here. Mr. Merriweather, do you have any students who would like to ask a question? Okay. Um, 
did you, were you unmuting? Were you ready? Okay, I'm not sure if his audio is connected correctly. All right, well, if we think of any other questions, would it be okay if we um, possibly emailed them to you? Because I'm sure there's lots of students who didn't get to ask who would have loved to. Sure, we would love that. That'll be just fine. Thank you. Well, this has been such a special, special thing for us today. And we are so gracious that you were willing to take time out of your day to do this with our students. So I just want to say on behalf of the teachers and the students at Laverne Lake Elementary, thank you so much. It's our pleasure. And as I say, we commend you all for the work you're doing. And if there's anything we can do to make your day a little easier, please call us and let us know. So. Awesome. Well, we everybody say it. bye. Great questions, kids. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you.